Okay, well, thank you everybody for coming. As you know, this is our second in this series, Hot Talks in Mediation. Uh, my name is Susan Franson Edwards, and um, today we're really excited to welcome our guest, a very special friend of EMA, Dr. Lori Layden. Um, Bruce is going to be introducing her, so I'm not going to say any more, but um, no, we will be recording this session and we're going to put it on the YouTube channel as well. You'll get an email and it will be up in both Ukrainian and English. There um, are a few documents, um, handouts that Lori has done, that Lori uses, and she will um, we'll provide them to you in Ukrainian because they have been translated, but we don't have them up right now. So um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Bruce. Thank you, Susan. Welcome, everyone. Um, welcome, Dr. Layden. It is wonderful to be here again with everyone. Uh, you'll recall uh, our first session, I quoted Dr. Martin Luther King by saying, out of a mountain of despair, a stone of hope. And uh, Dr. Layden is our stone of hope today. She's going to be sharing with you her experience and expertise in hopefully in very meaningful ways. Um, last night, and before I introduce her uh, further and get into today's important topic, uh, last night I was giving a, a lecture to uh, at a local law school to a group of law students, deans, professors, and other uh, um, folks entering the field of mediation. And the topic in part was uh, how to become more uh, self-caring and self-compassionate. And the lessons for the aspiring mediators was simply before you can learn to take care of others, you have to learn to take care of yourself. And that simple message is something that's often overlooked in the field of mediation training, and one which I uh, choose to try and emphasize, particularly when given the opportunity with young audiences. Um, we are all first responders. We're all first responders in the presence of conflict in our lives. And therefore, as first responders, uh, we need to be able to take care of ourselves. We need to learn to walk that narrow path between getting close to the flame of conflict and emotion without singeing ourself, without burning ourself in the process. Today's conversation with Dr. Layden is gonna be uh, how to do that effectively and how to do it appropriately, particularly in light of the various types of trauma that you all are undoubtedly experiencing as we move through this series of conversations. So uh, with that sort of background, let's do this. Um, Dr. Layden and uh, Lori and I are good friends, so uh, I will apologize in advance if I slip into the familiar and call you Lori. Um, please, please call me Lori. It just reflects the uh, dear friendship and how close we hold uh, Lori in our lives and hope to share her with you a bit today. <clears throat> um, uh, I, I taught for years in Austria with a psychotherapist, and he always taught me to help people understand why they want to listen to me, uh, and then the how-to will follow. So before I introduce you, Lori, and I promise I intend to in uh, appropriate detail, um, help people understand first thing uh, this morning or this evening for them, why today's conversation is so critical in their lives. Well, you introduced it, uh, Bruce, uh, and in my 15 years in the humanitarian world, in post-war mm -hmm. communities, post-genocide communities, um, uh, post-school shooting communities here in the U.S., uh, I realized quickly that we could not have one-on-one -on -one sessions with all the people who needed trauma healing. And so I began to realize that we need to scale and replicate the, this, these trauma healing skills to those people who serve traumatized people. And of course, first I, I wanna say how deeply, deeply uh, you are all in my prayers for what is happening in your country. Uh, and as are many of my colleagues uh, are joined in prayer groups uh, daily uh, for some peace. And, um, but in any case, what I realized was that the, we needed to train an army of what I call peace builders who were healing from the inside out. And uh, so my whole theme is caring for the service provider. <clears throat> because your impact on the number of people that you serve is so important. 
And if you're not managing your stress, if you're not clearing your trauma, um, it's really going to be difficult to see through the lens of your own stress and trauma in order to serve uh, as well as you can. And I'll be explaining the physiological basis of all of this, but can you imagine being able to feel completely in a place of inner safety and calm, no matter what is being presented to you in the moment? And that's how we feel that we can access our greatest gifts and talents and wisdom, and also create a res what we call a resonance field for other people that we're with to step into that peace and calm. So that's my mission really, is to make sure that those who are serving are taking care of themselves first. And that's why I'm so excited that Bruce and Susan really value this piece of self-care. Thank you, Lori. A great introduction. Um, I'd like to give people a little sense of your background. And you know me well enough to know I choose my words carefully, but truly you are an angel in those communities that you serve. Um, talk about your experience in uh, post-genocide Rwanda for a moment, if you will. That's where we first met. Yes. Do share a little bit of your background in dealing with these communities, these post-shooting tragedies that are unfortunately so common in our country. And, and pick an example like Sandy Hook, if you will, just so people have an idea of the almost unimaginable trauma that you've helped people work through. Yes. Thank you. Uh, well, first, it's my privilege and honor to serve. And the reason I do this work is because of my own commitment to healing my own childhood trauma, mm -hmm. which led me to want to be able to offer skills to people that were as easy and elegant as possible in terms of getting over that stress and trauma. And, and so I've spent a lifetime exploring what are the most efficient skills to do that. And that's where I'll be presenting some of that to you today. Uh, I started my humanitarian work in 2007 uh, in Rwanda, which was 13 years after the genocide. However, there was no mental health system still in the country. And there's no way to serve uh, the eight or nine million people who were traumatized from this event and who continue continued well after the genocide to be traumatized based on the unsettled nature of the country and the situations on the borders. Uh, as Ukrainians, you understand this all too well. Um, and it's extremely difficult to manage our stress when we're being constantly, we're, we're in like a chemical factory. We're constantly being bombarded personally and professionally, not to mention the political, the social, the cultural, the, the, you know, the access to basic resources, all of these things uh, are, uh, the fact that you can even show up to this call right now is exemplary. Uh, and so in Rwanda, we quickly saw, I worked with orphan genocide survivors. I worked with orphan heads of households who were, uh, six to eight years old at the time of the genocide and given two to six other children to raise with no visible means of support. I worked with um, widows who had been raped and tortured and mutilated, uh, left living with AIDS. Uh, you know, obviously the whole country was traumatized and with no mental health system, they um, responded by giving the trauma to ministers and religious people. And this ended up being that people would come to a church service, uh, a three hour church service and cathart their, their emotions. They would, uh, they would tell their stories. Unfortunately, this method re-traumatizes people. So every time you tell your story without a physiological tool to help you calm yourself, it's simply the, the brain believes that it's happening again, if that makes sense. And so uh, I quickly saw that these energy psychology tools that I'm going to introduce you to today were extremely effective in terms of uh, getting people to feel safe in their bodies, perhaps for the first time. And I imagine that you are all experiencing this, this racing 
physiology, the, the stress hormones, the cortisol, the steroids that pump into your body. So today it's really about resetting and giving you a sense of inner safety and calm. So in Rwanda, obviously uh, trauma too horrible to imagine, just as the stories come up, coming out of the Ukraine are. Uh, fast forward to Sandy Hook, Connecticut, uh, a town, a, a a city here where 26 year old babies were murdered and eight adults uh, on this particular day in a community of 30,000 people. Everyone was affected. Every teacher, every educator, every parent, every student, people who weren't even close to the in proximity to the, the shooting were impacted. Their sense of safety as a community was completely destroyed as I imagine many of you are experiencing as well. So I went to Sandy Hook for what I thought was going to be a few weeks and I stayed for three years. The, the key here is that I quickly saw that I needed to train a group of volunteers in the skills that I deliver. But the number one priority was to make sure that they cleared their own trauma about what happened first before they served uh, the community. And we saw that model work really, really well uh, because it also allows the service provider to access their own mastery. You are all mastering the art of mediation. So when you are physiologically safe in your body, your brain can respond more creatively. Uh, you can have a greater access to your intuition, to problem solving. And so this is the model that I now use, and I've used it in, uh, in Florida as well with uh, 200 mental health providers who were serving those who were impacted by the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas uh, school shooting where 17 people lost their lives and many others were injured. And then uh, for the last six or seven years, I've been working in Australia in Aboriginal communities where there really is a social and cultural and uh, financial genocide going on uh, for these indigenous people. I also work with refugee communities um, in Australia as well. The model is the same. Train the trainers, train the service providers to take care of themselves first so that we can have a greater impact and bring this work to more people. Lori, thank you for that. Uh, it's just breathtaking to even try and imagine what that experience must be like. Um, I, I don't want to um, get too quickly into techniques because we'll be talking about that in a few minutes, but I'm assuming you need to use many of these techniques yourself working in the capacity that you do. Absolutely. Uh, this is, is my life's work uh, to, uh, to manage my own stress and my own trauma. The beauty of the techniques I'm going to be sharing with you or introducing you to is that as a practitioner, I receive a physiological benefit when I am working with someone uh, because uh, I'm doing the work with them. I'm mirroring the work with them. So this is another real advantage. And you'll there is at least one technique that uh, you all will be able to bring to your clients immediately after we work together today. Uh, so, you know, that's my number one priority is if I don't put myself first, I can't possibly serve all these communities. And from this place, honestly, instead of my heart breaking in these circumstances, my heart breaks open to the possibilities because I have seen in each of these communities the miracles that can come out of tragedy. And I've seen the resilience of the human spirit in ways that, it, you know, to witness is a huge honor. So I have that sense of hope, uh, which is, uh, I think, so important. Uh, Lori, I know it probably is an obvious question, but maybe not so much to everybody. How do people know they're in trauma or in need of trauma-informed therapeutic approaches? Such a good question and such uh, in the public eye now. Um, almost any symptom we have, physical, emotional, mm -hmm. behavioral, can, we, can be a result of trauma. Um, but 
I think the most key identification is when you get quiet enough to scan your body and notice, are you contracted or are you expanded? Do you feel a lot of physiological upheaval that makes it difficult for you to think clearly? Uh, there are so many symptoms. That's the hyper uh, arousal piece. But then there's the, the, the hypo arousal piece, which is that feeling of lethargy, uh, foggy brain, um, uh, depression, uh, so there is a wide range and it also then there are somatic body centered illnesses that arise because stress impacts the immune system. And so you'll see things uh, like um, gastrointestinal problems, insomnia, uh, uh, back pain, uh, headaches, uh, any kind of physio physiological reaction can be that. Uh, so I guess the biggest thing, and it, you know, I could take a whole year to go through all the, the ways that, uh, but I think what's important as someone is sitting in front of you um, is not to interpret their or judge their behavior until you really know if there's trauma and stress at, at work. And I think for, for mediators, as well as service other service providers, uh, because we don't feel safe in what we're experiencing. We judge the client or we judge the circumstance, which then uh, interferes with how we are going to mediate that situation. So a great deal of compassion needs to arise from this, which arises when we do our own self-care and we become masters at our own physiology, we will recognize in someone else when they need these stress tools. Does that make sense? It makes total sense. And so uh, starting with sort of inward self-reflection, becoming more in tune with what you describe as somatic markers or physical manifestations of stressors in the environment would be the first clue. Obviously paying attention to impacts on your relationships with others, uh, as you've discussed, all of those things are, are cues and clues to what someone may be experiencing uh, and ultimately to reserve judgment in others as you begin to work with them. Um, Lori, in terms of the potential application of these lessons you're about to share with us, I'm curious, are they lessons that can be taught to young children, to elderly people, to the full breadth of the community? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and, and we're gonna have our own experience of it um, these kinds of, I mean, it's not like after an hour and a half, you're all going to be prepared to go out and teach all these things, but there are several tools you'll be able to work with yourself first. And as you get more confident with them, you can deliver to other people, but it's so it's based on ancient Chinese acupressure. And so this is something that we can administer to ourselves and to other people. Children respond incredibly uh, of course, we worked with many, many, many school children in, in Sandy Hook and in Parkland, Florida, um, and the, the results are astounding. So that's the good news. Potentially a function of the neuroplasticity that is so uh, available to children as they develop coping mechanisms, I assume, and other ways of sort of dealing with trauma. Themselves. Yes. yes, yeah. Um, <clears throat> Uh, this may be a question you want to uh, touch on later, but give people a preview if you would, Lori. How does somebody know that they have sufficiently dealt with their own internal trauma to be in a position to truly help others? In other words, and this is an inartful phrase, but get, getting unstuck, you know, if you will, so that they can truly be a first responder of some assistance. How, do, how does one know that they've crossed that threshold? Well, and I sound a bit like I'm um, on repeat here, uh, but again, it's when you tune into your own physiology and you feel a sense of calm, I mean, you might be in a, in a, uh, uh, in action mode, but still feel calm in your body, still your, that your, 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 your mind is not racing. Your mind is working with you, not against you. Your physiology is working with you. 
not against you. Um, and for some, for many people, they've never experienced inner safety. And I'm talking about a, a physiological sensation here. So in Rwanda, I worked with a hundred orphan head of households who, as I mentioned, had been taking care of two to six other children for the last 13 years uh, with no visible means of support. They, they were not welcomed by communities. Um, it, it was quite an amazing hardship that these young people had sacrificed their lives to take care of these other young people. And so I worked with them for about 30 minutes on this particular protocol that I'll share with you today. And I realized at the end, they had, they had their stress level had gone from on a scale of zero to 10, from a 10 to a two. And we were all sitting there after the process and there was a knock on the door uh, because lunch was ready. And as you and Susan know, um, food is very important. Sometimes this could be their only meal that they're going to eat. Um, and so I fully expected a stampede out the door to the lunch table, but everyone just continued to sit. And I said, so tell me, you know, what, what are you feeling inside? Uh, would you rather sit here or go to lunch? We wanna sit in this place. What are you feeling? It's it's amazing. I feel the sense of calm in my body for the first time. And I realized it was the first time. They were born at a time of war, um, as you all can relate to. Um, and now, 20 years later, they're still had never experienced that inner safety. This was the that's when I realized the importance of the physiological reset. That if we don't have to resolve every issue, but if people can feel safe in their bodies, safe in their hearts, safe in their minds, what's possible from that place? So that was the biggest lesson I learned, and I've spent 15 years now, you know, teaching that. Um, a little roundabout answer to your question. But after today, I'll be curious to ask that question what people are feeling that might be different in their body after we do these exercises. Thank and if you. you have a question, and if you have a question, that's when you need to consult a professional. If you even think that you may, you know, have trauma that needs to be released, then ask for help, which is another really hard thing for service providers to do. So, it's really important to be able to seek out and receive the help we need. No one is meant to do this all by themselves and certainly not uh, to deal with trauma, which is actually a creates a brain dysfunction. Um, so that's my two cents. Another question or so, and I'm gonna turn things over to you, Lori. Um, but I assume as you know very well, we've got a multitude of people listening to you today and everybody has a unique experience, meaning in part, their traumatic experiences are different and perhaps uh, a, a different range of, of impact uh, on their lives. I assume that what you're about to share with people has meaning and value regardless of the degree of trauma, but at some point you'll also touch on what people do depending on the degree of trauma they're experiencing. Yes, absolutely. And I will address that while I'm Fabulous. Let's do, let's do this. Uh, this has been, I think, a, a wonderful introduction, uh, both to you personally, Lori, and to what you have to offer. Uh, I've said this before, but I, you know, I don't know how one begins to appropriately thank someone for their life's work, but there's a short line in heaven for people that uh, do what you do. So, um, Thank you. You could be right beside me, Bruce. Yeah, thank you, Lori. Um, the, uh, um, uh, the, the generosity of your time, your wisdom, and really your open heart today is uh, truly appreciated. So I'll turn things over to you. I'll uh, be right here learning along with everyone else. Beautiful. Um, and I would encourage people to, uh, if, if you have the bandwidth to be able to be on video, it would be great to see your beautiful faces. Um, before I explain anything, I want to take you through an exercise um, to introduce you to some of the things that we'll be doing. And so uh, it looks a little funny, but as I mentioned before, well, I've been doing this work for 15 years. We've got 30 years of 
of uh, research to validate uh, this work that we do. It's based on ancient Chinese acupressure. So we're tapping on certain points on the head and the body, um, which sends a signal to the brain that the brain is safe in, in, uh, uh, in the presence of what's going on. So uh, I'm gonna ask you to close your eyes for a moment and tune into your breathing. And on a scale of zero to 10, with zero being no contraction in your breathing at all, and 10 being the most contraction that you can imagine, give it a number, zero to 10. And just keep that number in mind. So again, we're looking at as you breathe in and breathe out, how constricted is your inhale? How constricted is your exhale? And give that a number. And now you can open your eyes. And I'm just going to lead you through something called tap and breathe. It's very simple. You're going to follow me on certain points. We're going to start here at the gamut point, which is on the back of the hand between the fourth and the fifth finger. And we're going to just gently tap here. And I want you to imagine that you're breathing through a straw. And so we're going to make a noise as we inhale. And we're going to make a noise on the exhale. And the reason I exaggerate the breathing like this is because most people aren't breathing very well. And so we need to exaggerate that inhale and that exhale. So the next point is at the top of the head. And again, we're going to breathe as if through a straw. Inhale and exhale. Beginning of the eyebrow. Inhale, and exhale. Outside of the eye here, inhale, and exhale. Under the eye, inhale. And exhale. And noticing how those inhales and exhales may be deepening now. And the next point is under the nose. Inhale. And exhale. Under the lips. Inhale. And exhale. Here on the chest, inhale. And exhale. Under the arm, right here, inhale. And exhale. And back on the top of the hand, inhale. And exhale. And I'm going to ask you to close your eyes and tune into your breathing once again. And just notice what you notice, zero to 10. What's that number now? And notice if there's been any difference. So at this point, I would ask uh, if I could read Ukrainian. I'd ask you to put your, uh, your number in the chat uh, or just a notion, perhaps one of the translators could, could uh, help me out with this. Um, if people would put into the chat if they noticed any drop in their numbers. And while we're dropping that into the chat, I will say so, Galena. You you you're at a five now, or you were at a five before? It was one, and now it's five. Okay, meaning uh, one being no contraction because zero is. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was uh, nearly without breathing. 
at the beginning. Yeah. And now you're feeling more expanded. Yeah. Okay. So the, just to explain that the scale is zero to 10 with 10 being the most contraction you can have and zero being no contraction. So you're, you're less contracted or more. So Lori contraction being tighter, tighter. Thank you. Of more air of more breathing, free breathing. Great. And I'll just make, I see people uh, popping things into the chat, which is great. Uh, Galena, I saw you um, yawning, and I want to say that yawn. We love yawning when we're doing EFT tapping, because yawning tells us we're relaxing. So you can imagine, uh, as a practitioner teaching to a room full of people, and I see people yawning, and I'm so excited. I don't think that they're bored. I know that their physiology is coming down, and you might. You might even sometimes burp, a little burp, or your eyes might water, not tears, but just watery eyes. Um, so I see that we have, so, so you're beginning to sense the possibilities here. Let's do one more round. Um, and the reason I take the time with this is because this is pivotal. I'm gonna tell you how you can use this, but when you have your own experience of this, um, you're going to know that you have the tools at your fingertips to manage your stress immediately. So we're gonna do one more round. And again, tune into what that number is now, zero to 10. I'm gonna do one more round. And we'll start with the back of the hand. I'm gonna have you inhale as if through a straw. And the reason why I do this straw breathing is because many of you may not realize that you're not taking the full inhale or the full exhale. And then oxygen doesn't get to your brain, you can't think clearly, and then the stress hormones pump again. So inhale and exhale. Top of the head, inhale and exhale. Beginning of the eyebrow, inhale. And exhale. Side of the eye, inhale. And exhale. Under the eye, inhale. And exhale. Under the nose, inhale. And exhale. Under the lips, inhale. And exhale. Here on the chest, inhale. And exhale. Under the arm, inhale. And exhale. Top of the hand, inhale. And exhale. And again, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. Notice what you notice about your breathing, zero to 10. What's that number now? And just put that into the chat, if you would, the number you started at and the number that you're at now. And just notice what you notice in your body. Have your shoulders dropped a little? Are you sitting more deeply in the chair? Is there less tension in your body? Not. 
So most people seem to be at a three or a two, which is great. And, but it's okay if it takes longer. Now that those two rounds only took us less than five minutes. You have five minutes every couple of hours to do tap and breathe as a reset. And I actually have people start their sessions with tap and breathe. This is a way that um, you can start to manage your process, the, manage the mediation process immediately by having people do this tap and breathe before they want to tell their story or before they're, it just helps them physiologically reset. But more importantly, and just as importantly, it, you're doing it, the tap and breathe with them at the beginning of a session. So you're clearing yourself and bringing yourself more present before you begin. Does that make sense? <clears throat> Any comments, any questions? And again, we just did two, two rounds. Um, and it's possible to do this. I ask my clients to do this every hour for three minutes. It makes them more efficient, more productive. They feel better. The mind chatter goes away. And I would really encourage each of you to do that as well. Do it with your children. Do it in the morning. Do it at night. Yes, Bruce. Um, a couple questions. When you're tapping with two hands, do you do them simultaneously or do you alternate or is, does it matter? It doesn't matter. That's a great question. Um, and I will get into that uh, in, in a moment. But it, it, um, so I see Galena knows how to tap, which is great. Um, and so originally the, 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 we did it with two hands. Uh -huh. I've gotten into the habit of doing it with one hand. Um, and there is no difference in the research, whether you use two hands or one hand. Um, I start with the side of the hand as Galena is talking about, and uh, and we end on the gamut point, which is a, a new point, that's the trauma point. So if you can't, if you're in public um, and you can't be doing this <laughs> in the middle of the room, you can just tap on this point under the table or or no one is going to question uh, that you're just taking an inhale or an exhale. This is another point where, I mean, instead of doing this, you could simply hold this point as you take a breath, inhale and exhale. And just feel how good it feels to keep your hand here, um, uh, which is the chi energy getting moving in your body. <clears throat> Does that answer your question? Bruce. It does. I, and I think Galena has a question next. Yes. And you're ha you'll have handouts with all uh -huh. of these uh, points. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, Galena. Would it make sense to do this and the affirmations like, I am Galena, I am well, I am safe, something like this? I am translating this. Um, I'm in the English channel. Is it possible and useful to uh, use some affirmations during tapping? Like, I'm Galina, I'm okay, and et cetera, et cetera, to, to tell something for myself. See, you know too much already, Galina. Um, <laughs> this is the introduction, just tap and breathe. No okay. words, no words are necessary. I'm going to okay. show you another protocol which you're familiar with. Um, okay. but this is why this is so easy. Okay. All you do is tap and breathe, and you don't have to remember anything but the points. That's it. So it's the quickest way. Oftentimes being silent is also much easier than trying to come up with words at a particular point. But I will demonstrate and we'll do it as a group, um, the more uh, lengthy protocol. Uh, but great question. Thank you. Any other questions about tap and breathe? Now, I'm going to digress a bit and show. Uh, Go ahead. It seems one more question from Alec. Oh, sorry. Yes. Ole. Uh, sorry. Alec, you can ask in English. Oh, thank you, Galena. Mm -hmm. um, actually, uh, Laurie, thank you very much for this technique. Um, 
I have an experience about 15 years in uh, Eastern martial arts and in mediation. Uh, oh, sorry, in meditation. <laughs> and uh, yes, and this technique is absolutely wonderful because it's different uh, from all the others I practiced because you can use it everywhere. And it gives a great result just in minutes. Thank you for this. Mm, you're so welcome. Thank you. Um, I'm going to just run through because I know you guys like to have scientific background here. Um, but I want to give you an explanation of some of the background with. So this technique is called EFT, which stands for for emotional freedom techniques, or more commonly as tapping. And so I'm gonna show you, I'm showing you this picture of the brain here, where um, you can see this little almond shape in the, in the, in the middle of, this, of the brain is called the amygdala, and then underneath it is the hippocampus. And the beauty of EFT is that when we tap on these acupressure points, we send a signal to the amygdala, which is what we call the smoke detector. This is the part of the brain that scans for stress and trauma. And it communicates with the hippocampus, which is our memory center. And when we're stressed or traumatized, that communication gets blocked. And we either get into hypo arousal or hyper arousal. Um, and so when, as we're tapping on these points, we're telling the brain that it's safe and it sends a signal for the amygdala and the hippocampus to be able to communicate better, more efficiently, more functionally. So with the amygdala, you probably have heard of the fight, flight, freeze response. The amygdala is responsible for that. So we don't want the amygdala on hyperarousal when there's no need to, 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 to run or fight or defend ourselves. And also we want it communicating properly with the memory center because what happens with the hippocampus is those memories, those stressful memories get stored in the brain. Like, you know, when you read the news, when you hear uh, violence outside, when you're, uh, Whatever was happening at the time of the trauma may get stuck in that memory system. And we want to be able for you to have that memory and feel safe in the presence of that memory um, without it hijacking your physiology. Does that make sense? So, you know, for example, and, and you you all have way too many examples. In Sandy Hook, there were many, many fire drills after the school shooting to prepare children uh, to, to be safe. Unfortunately, every time that bell rang, um, it would traumatize the students because that bell was going off a lot during, do, during the, the violence. And so we were able to use this tap and breathe to have people feel safe in the presence of that that, that bell so that they literally could think more clearly about what they needed to do next. What position did they need to do? How did they, how could they uh, participate in the exercise? Now, <clears throat> this has been researched in 10 countries, at least there's over a hundred studies published. Uh, it's been used with millions and millions of people, especially in war-torn countries and post, uh, post natural disasters. Uh, so I can speak very confidently. Um, um, and this is what I was describing before, the impact of trauma on our brain. If you can imagine this, uh, this is the normal range here in this little rectangle with the dotted lines. It's the norm where we resiliently can be able to deal with stress on a day-to-day -day basis. But when we have an extreme event and or constant stress, we can get stuck in the on position as you see above the, the dotted line there, where as I referred to before, you can feel that anxiety, panic, hyperactivity, uh, exaggerated startle response, the inability to relax, restlessness, hypervigilance, always looking for 
what's happening. Um, digestive problems, emotional flooding of, of memories, um, chronic pain, sleeplessness, a lot of anger here, hostility, uh, rage, which you may see a lot of in your mediation. Um, and then down below here, below the dotted line, this is where we get stuck in the off position where you're feeling that lethargy or depression. Uh, there's this what we call flat affect, no emotion, feeling disconnected or even dissociated, like just not present in your body. Um, you can experience low blood pressure, but pain can also be uh, an issue here as well. Um, but just to know that tapping is helping us get back to this normal range, if that makes sense. Uh, let's see, there was one other, I guess I have to stop my share. There we go. Isn't technology amazing? Uh, so I think this is highly uh, impressive. This is the result of the research that's been done over the years. And I partner with the leading researcher in the world, Dr. Peter Stapleton. Um, and uh, uh, these are some of the markers we found after one session of uh, EFT. 37% down cortisol. Cortisol is one of the major stress hormones. So in one hour, your cortisol can go down 37%. Uh, our immune system can be boosted by up to 113%. Pain levels, EFT for pain is a miracle. I, I like to say that we have all the medicine right inside of us and that tapping on these acupressure points releases that medicine, that endorphins into our body so we can feel more calm and peaceful. Anxiety down 40%, depression 35%, um, PTSD 32%, uh, happiness goes up 31%, blood pressure down 8%, uh, food cravings 74%. And the reason why I think this is so large is because Dr. Peta is an expert in food disorders and food cravings. So that's been the bulk of her work and that's how effective it is for food cravings. Um, but this is really amazing right here, which is uh, we have a program with veterans of war here in the United States with post-traumatic stress disorder. And after 10 sessions of tapping, their symptoms went down 53% and stayed that way six months later. So we know, and I certainly know from my own um, uh, clinical work, I have witnessed the power of this uh, on so many levels. Um, any questions about the research or the, the brain dysfunction? I mean, all of this is simply to give you a simple explanation for how we physically reset our bodies. And I'm going to explain one other thing, which is what uh, I refer to as the heart-brain-body connection. So the heart has its own brain, meaning that it has its own neuronal cells that are identical to the neuronal cells in our physical brain. And what we know is that the heart was the first organ in the body to form, which begs the question, what organ is directing the development of the rest of the body? We believe it's the heart now. And the heart transmits a master hormone that regulates our bodies. So when we are in stress and trauma, the heart is communicating with your reptilian brain. That is the old brain that is all about survival mode. When our hearts are um, uh, feeling that calm and peace, they are communicating directly with the prefrontal cortex, which is the higher brain, which is, which is the seat of your sense of uh, creativity, of intuition, of really even a sense of connectedness and transcendence. Um, and so when the heart and the brain are optimized through EFT, we now have this heart-brain-body connection that is functioning 
well together and imagine being able to tap into that inner wisdom, the intuition, all the resources you need in the moment to deliver what it is you need to deliver, whether it's answers for yourself or someone else. And just imagine being in that calm state of being, no matter what is going on, that my heart and my brain are communicating. And so in places, and this is going to seem off the mark because we're talking about stress and trauma, but the heart, the highest resonance field of the heart comes with the energies of gratitude, love, joy, and wonder. Now, when we're stressed and traumatized, gratitude, love, joy, and wonder go out the window, right? Um, and yet, that is something you can do to reset yourself, is to focus for two minutes on what you have to be grateful for. And, and we will do that, actually. Um, but I wanted to explain the importance of that we have all the resources we need right inside of us. And that heart, brain, body connection is really where we need, where EFT does the best work of regulating our physiology so that we're functioning on all cylinders, as we like to say in the United States. And if you can imagine that um, I've been obviously in many, many, many situations that were uh, highly volatile, highly reactive, um, and because of all this work that I've done on myself to relieve my own trauma and to use this, these EFT tapping skills, I am confident now that as I sit in the midst of what could be very, very challenging situations, that if I calm my heart, my brain, and my body, I will have access to the information that I need in the moment. So instead of trying to control a situation, I'm able to look for what wants to emerge here. And I don't know if I'm getting too far off the mark here, but uh, I think the best mediation comes from a place where the mediator is able to hold space for the most positive outcomes to emerge. That means that the mediator has to believe in that, that we have to trust that, we have to feel confident in that. And so um, that has been one of the greatest gifts that I have been able to give myself, which is optimizing my heart brain body connection so I can be fully present. Does that make sense? Absolutely. It does to me, it does to me as a mediator, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Lori, we do have a few questions. That sure. Yes. Um, the first one, Any? Uh, is there any use for this technique, not for myself, but for someone else who doesn't mind, I, it keeps bouncing around, I apologize, who doesn't mind such, who, who would not, who would like to use this, I think is, is what it's saying. <laughs> So can yeah. you do it with help someone else? Uh, yes. However, my caution is you must practice these tools on yourself first so that you get the confidence to deliver them. Because we got to keep in mind that the tool is for you first. And then as you get confident in it, you can deliver it to other people. And how to do, oh, sorry. No, no, fine. Go ahead. How, how to do it correctly? Just to demonstrate or to comment or how to do it? When you're teaching someone else? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Always, always, always tap on yourself while you're tapping with other people. You see, I did that when I showed you the tool because every time I do this, I'm getting a physiological benefit. So, uh, Literally, always do it on yourself first and just have them watch, have them just follow you. Just do what I'm doing. Just do what I'm doing. Now, the key here, and see, it, it looks easy, uh, tap and breathe. But if you're not breathing yourself, if you're not noticing um, and you're stressed, you're not going to see whether your client is actually breathing fully inhaling, fully exhaling. 
And this is key uh, because even I've watched a number of people and they're like, they don't do the breathing, but they're holding their breaths. And when we're stressed and traumatized, we're holding our breath all the time. And this is why I say, if you can do tap and breathe every hour for three minutes, six or eight times through the day, after two days, you will feel your body regulating on its own. That's how powerful this is. Uh, yes, Oleg. Yes, uh, Lori, please tell. Uh, if uh, how much matters the frequency of tapping and the power of tapping? The frequency? And the power which, uh, with which oh. we tap. Yes. Uh, you don't have to worry about how long. Um, definitely do not injure yourself. It, it can be very gentle. <laughs> okay. Uh, some people think if they do it harder, it'll work faster. Uh, but no, it's not necessary. Very gentle. And when you're doing tap and breathe, just think about it. If you inhale and exhale, that's enough tapping on that point. So you don't even have to think about how many taps or how hard should I do it? But those are great questions. Thank you. Lori, there's a couple questions or another question that came in, but I have a question I'm going to ask you on that same note. When you're breathing in, I tend to breathe in, even if I'm pretending to breathing through a straw, longer. But I think you were doing it shorter. Is there any correct? Uh, I hope I wasn't doing it shorter. Okay. Uh, so okay. That's a good question. <laughs> I um, took my glasses off, so maybe that was part oh, of it. Oh, sure. I'm sure. Uh, basically, the reason we're doing the straw breathing is so that people can physiologically feel. We want you to inhale as fully as possible, pause, and then exhale as fully as possible. And the reason I didn't give you too many details is because actually the, the, the tapping accomplishes this. But what we really want to know is, am I taking that full inhale and full exhale. I'm so adept at watching my clients that I can tell, you know, they, they might give me a great exhale, but there's no inhale. <laughs> um, so that's the importance or, or the other way around. Great inhale, no exhale. So we're just trying to even out the breathing because think about what happens. The, the brain thinks it's suffocating when we're not inhaling. So we go into overdrive the minute you stop breathing, and I guarantee you, you stop breathing throughout the day. And so th that's why doing this every hour for several days will really lock it in. You will be more aware of when you're contracted, when you need to do the tap and breathe. And we spend this time on this exercise because this is how powerful this can be. If you take nothing away from what we talk about, just do this tap and breathe. Um, now I'm going to get into another protocol where, so that you can see the, oh, I'm sorry. Are there any other questions about tap and breathe? Um, there's one, thank you for your experience, Lori. Is there any way to get rid of headaches caused by mental and emotional stress? Yes. Um, you can, it's so good for pain relief. It's not even funny. Uh, so I'm going to give you two answers. Right now you could use tap and breathe for your headaches, but I'm going to go into another protocol, which you will see can be adapted uh, for pain relief. Now, we're not gonna learn everything in the next hour, um, but the whole point is to give you an introduction, to give you enough so that you can go and practice on your own. And if it, I would be more than happy to do another session where we can practice more, bring your questions um, after you've had some time to apply it to yourself, if that's okay. Um, so we're now, we're going to move into a different protocol and not to worry about the, um, the steps or anything, just follow me. You're gonna have handouts in, in uh, is it Ukrainian? Is that the language? Okay. Because in Rwanda, it's Kinyarwanda. So you don't know if it 
if the name of the language matches the country name. Um, <clears throat> so you'll have handouts that describe all of this. But what I wanted to do, uh, two things. I wanted to demonstrate what we call the basic EFT protocol. Uh, and we're going to do this using what I call a petty annoyance. Is that term uh, translatable in Ukrainian? Something, a petty annoyance is something on a scale of zero to 10, where 10 is the most stressful and zero, no stress. A petty annoyance is like a five or below. Not your biggest trauma, something that's been annoying you perhaps for a couple of days. Uh, so a little thing, the kids didn't put the dishes in the dishwasher. Uh, your husband left his socks on the floor, uh, that kind of thing. And I want you to tune in to pick one example of that in your mind. Again, I want it to be a five or below because I want you to be available uh, for, for the learning in this moment. And then later, if we have time, I'll demonstrate it one on one with someone. Um, so everybody have a what I call a petty annoyance in mind. And have you rated it zero to 10? And if it's over a five, pick something else. <laughs> um, so now that you have your petty annoyance, you're just going to follow me. And I'm going to say the word petty annoyance, but you are going to drop in your, your petty annoyance. So you're going to pick a phrase that describes that. Dishes in the dishwasher or socks on the floor. So whenever I say petty annoyance, you're tuning into your own petty annoyance. Does that make sense? Great. So we start at the side of the hand with what we call a setup statement. And the setup statement does two things. It uh, combines the problem we're experiencing with what we want to be experiencing. So in this case, you're going to repeat after me. Even though I have this petty annoyance, and you're going to drop in your own thing. And then the second part of the statement is, I deeply and completely love and accept myself. Now, it doesn't mean that you necessarily love and accept yourself in this moment, but that's the goal, right? And so we do that three times on the side of the hand. Um, and it would be helpful if I could uh, just to see for pacing, if you repeat, if you mouth the words so I could see when you're finished and I could go on to the next uh, part of the statement. Okay, so we're going to start here. Even though I have this petty annoyance, and you repeat it. I deeply and completely love and accept myself. Second time, even though I have this petty annoyance, I deeply and completely love and accept myself. Third time, even though I have this petty annoyance, I deeply and completely love and accept myself and just take a full inhale and a full exhale and now we're going to repeat the problem on each of these points this petty annoyance top of the head beginning of the eyebrow this petty annoyance Side of the eye, this petty annoyance. Under the eye, this petty annoyance. Under the nose, this petty annoyance. Under the lips, this petty annoyance. On the chest, this petty annoyance. Under the arm, this petty annoyance. The top of the hand, this petty annoyance. I'm gonna ask you to close your eyes, move inside, take another full inhale, another full exhale, and tune into your petty annoyance 
zero to 10, what's that number now? And just pop into the chat what number you may have started at, what number it is now, if you would. And tell me where you started, right? So Ole went from a four to a one. <clears throat> Galena's at a four. Susan went from a three to a one. And a five to a two, great. Now, we don't just do one round and expect to it for it to get to zero, right? Um, and sometimes the number can go up a little bit because uh, you may have it may have uncovered something more stressful, but not to worry about that. Uh, these are great numbers. Um, so we're going to do another round. And for those of you, I'm going to ask Louisa and, oh, it's Anastasia, I was going to say, an iPhone. Uh, and Ole, those who have come down to a one, have you noticed any shift in your thinking about the petty annoyance? Okay, so we have some head nods. And after we do the next round, um, I'll ask you more about that. And not to worry if uh, this seems foreign to you and silly and crazy. We're just having an experience. Um, and so let's see what happens with the next round. And again, tune into what your number is on that petty annoyance is now. We're sticking with the same petty annoyance, right? <clears throat> I'm going to start tapping again. Even though. I still have some of this petty annoyance. I deeply and completely love and accept myself. Even though I still have some of this petty annoyance, I deeply and completely love and accept myself. Even though I still have some of this petty annoyance. I deeply and completely love and accept myself. Top of the head, this petty annoyance. Beginning of the eyebrow, this petty annoyance. Side of the eye, this petty annoyance. Under the eye, this petty annoyance. Under the nose, this petty annoyance. Under the lips, this petty annoyance. Chest, this petty annoyance. Under the arm, this petty annoyance. Top of the hand, this petty annoyance. And again, I'll ask you to close your eyes. Take that full inhale, that full exhale. Tune into your petty annoyance, zero to 10. What's that number now? And as you tune into that petty annoyance, has there been any shift in your thinking? And just pop those numbers into the chat if you would. And for anyone who is um, at a one and you'd like to unmute yourself, uh, I could ask you a couple of questions. So Susan says, uh, the petty annoyance seems silly now. Uh, anyone else? You can feel free to. Kate says, feels like it flew away. Isn't that wonderful? So we're not trying to tap out the problem, but we're allowing you to have a physiological reset so that when you consider the problem, you can even consider whether you want it renting space in your head or whether really you've already found a solution for it or it doesn't matter. Uh, Ole 
my one seems to stop existing. Yes, yeah. And so I then I asked the question, so from this place of a one, where you've had this shift in your thinking, what's possible the next time this comes up? Or what's possible in this place? If that question makes any sense. Sorry, could you ask it again? Yes. So, and actually you could be helpful to me, Galena. If in just a couple of words, what was your petty annoyance about? Someone threw away my jars, my empty jars. Okay. And and what that was a what was the number you started with? Chitirka. From a four. And that, where is it now, a one? Uh, zero point two. <laughs> okay, excellent. So someone threw away my jars. What's the shift in your in your thinking now? Uh, well, it's now like round shape. There's none, I would say. Okay, so what's possible when you think about someone threw away my jars? Uh, what do you mean? Uh, as you think about someone threw away my jars, now there's no tension, correct? So when I say someone threw away your jars, what happens inside? Well, I know who did it, actually. <laughs> okay, that's a whole nother protocol right there. <laughs> um, however, <laughs> it, it, brings, it brings up a great point because EFT is like peeling away the layers of an onion, okay? So originally, Galena thinks some, the, the issue, the petty annoyance is somebody threw away my jars. As her physiology comes down, she has this new memory or thought that says, I know who did it. So here's where I would then say, as you tune into, I know who did it, on a scale of zero to 10, how intense is I know who did it? If you had to give it a number. Did it. <laughs> a nine. A nine. Okay. So that's a trauma protocol we're going to have to get into. Uh, I don't know how much time we have, but we may come back to this. Uh, I think the important point, though, here, and even Galena sees the, the point, is that as we peel away the onion, the layers of the onion, the underlying stress becomes more apparent. We have access to what I call the aspects of this petty annoyance. So the next time we do this exercise, uh, for example, I could have said, tune into your petty annoyance. And of all the aspects of the petty annoyance, which is the most intense? And, and Galena may or may not have been aware that the real anger was she knew who did it. Uh, anything you want to say about that, Galena? Well, I'm afraid I'm going to then go out of the 10 scale and way out. So no, exactly. I just meant, uh, yes, in terms of commenting on a new aspect emerging, and that's where the work is. And, and yes, uh, given our time constraints, um, we will. Uh, actually, I would ask you to do this, Galena. I want you to um, imagine that we could put all of what's left of this issue into a container until you and I can safely, or you can safely open that container and work with that issue again. Would that be okay? So I just want you to imagine a container in your mind's eye, just make it up. 
Imagine what it looks like. Imagine it has a color, a shape. What is it made out of? And I want you to take a moment just to imagine putting all of what's left of this issue in the container. And just let me know when you feel complete with that. I'm done. It's there. I okay. just shoved it in. I just said it wouldn't want to go in, but, you know, I made it. And is there anything we need to do to secure this container? It's like in a Swiss bank. I got the key. Beautiful. I can lock it. So this is something I wasn't planning on, on presenting, but it's, it's, it's easy and it's really great when we don't have a lot of time to unpack the issue. Um, and so it's something you can easily do at the end of your sessions as well. Um, and certainly with yourself when you're, if you, if you feel like you're getting hijacked. Um, so again, we just did a very simple exercise, but you see here now we're adding words and the words are important. We stick with one aspect at a time. So the one aspect was somebody threw away the jars. When we get down to a zero to two on that, then we can address the other aspects of the problem that are coming up. Does that make sense? Um, Galena. What if I don't just put it away for storage, but maybe dissolve it somehow or burn it, destroy it somehow? Is that okay or not? Well, um, it is if if it allows you to have a physiological reset and if it allows you to come up with a solution. Uh, but that's where I would say continue to tap uh, um, on it because that's going to bring you the resolution probably more quickly, if that makes sense. Ole, you had your hand up. Are you uh, good? Yeah, Lori. Uh, you know, actually, I had almost um, the same thing as Galina had uh, when at, during the first time we were tapping. I understood that uh, the cup left on the table uh, is uh, not disturbing for me anymore. But the cat uh, scratched uh, my wife. And uh, he was actually very actively getting into my mind. And I had to put it out of there. So I understood that my mind became free of this cap. But uh, and, uh, it was ready to um, deal with more serious problem emotionally for me. So thank you very much for this discussion with Galina. It was very useful for me. Beautiful. Uh, and again, I know it seems rather strange. Don't worry too much about the instructions. It's more about having the experience of it. Um, and you'll have the handouts that you can study in order to adapt this. And when you're first doing this, I suggest doing it on these petty annoyances first, because those the trauma pieces really require a very skilled person uh, to deal with uh, with that stuff. Uh, any other comments, questions? Um, and we can do another petty annoyance or I can work with someone, anyone uh, who wants to work one-on-one. -on -one. The other piece to the beauty of this is that, um, and I'll come to your question, Oh, we have two Ole's uh, in just a moment. Um, uh, yes. Lori, Lori, my some, small comment. Actually, uh, I'm, we are working this, uh, uh, okay. 
objectivization is objective. I like uh, any objective criteria, you know. And I have some special machine. Yes. And I'm, me I'm measuring my blood pressure now. Yeah. And actually, actually, it's dropping. Yeah. So it's it's lower now than it was before. Thank you. Beautiful. And how's your heart rate? Uh, doesn't matter. It's slower. Okay. Also. Beautiful. I love yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> It's like I planted Galena in here. Oh my goodness. Uh, yes, Ole. Oleg, uh, your question, please, if you're willing. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, Lori, uh, could you? Uh, uh, do you think that uh, uh, my one uh, uh, may dedicate 24 hours uh, to tapping, uh, to tap uh, out all the problems and get rid of them uh, once and for good? Uh, that's a great question. And I actually know people who have made a list of all of their the things that annoy them of all the things that continue to be like you know when you think about that guy bullying me in the third grade if that's still on your mind make a list of all of these things we call it the personal peace procedure and one by one you can take a couple of them a day uh and and work with them uh if that makes sense so you know if i want to clear the memory of something that continue like a you know I'm still having an argument in my head with my ex-husband. I want to tap on that. I'll put it on my list. <laughs> uh, to spend 24 hours a day on it, however, may interfere with your mediation business. <laughs> Lori, there are a few, few questions in the um, chat. Can I read the first yeah. one? Mm -hmm. I observe that while tapping on a small irritation, I begin to clearly realize and feel that there is something else besides this irritation, the body, breath, life. Thank you. Wow. And then there, there is another one, but I apologize. Um, I do not see it in English. Um, I, will, I will send it to you now. Maybe okay. uh, uh, while uh, Lori will answer the first one. Uh, just that, uh, what a beautiful reframe, we call it a reframe, to go from the petty annoyance to feel that, I think what you're describing is a beautiful sense of peace in your heart and what really matters. So imagine being able to come to that so quickly every day. Why would we not give ourselves that gift every day? Remember when I talked about the heart brain body connection? Literally, that you're optimizing for a sense of transcendence and connectedness. That's that's our spirituality. That's our connection to the divine, if you will. And that's really what we're going for, is to remember mm -hmm. who we really are. To remember the best of ourselves and what life has to offer in the middle of the stress and trauma that you're all experiencing. I call it body prayer. Because so many times when we pray, we're beseeching for something. But yet when we move into that quiet space inside, that's where we connect with the divine. I hope it's okay to bring some spirituality in there. Um, absolutely. Lori, here's another question. I want to make sure we get to all of them. Are there cases when this tapping technique should not be used? For example, when there is a lot of irritation. So again, uh, that's why I would stick with tap and breathe. Tap and breathe can never hurt anyone if it's being applied appropriately. Uh, using these protocols, however, to manage a, a, a person who is highly dysregulated um, may require a professional. So again, this is why I say practice on yourself first. Practice, practice, practice. 
And then you will know how far you can go with someone else. But at this point, this is just for your self-care. Um, and I would never, I mean, people have studied with me for months and months and months before I let them work with traumatized, I mean, highly traumatized clients. It seems simple, but there's a lot more to it. Um, that's why we're going to practice on yourself and hopefully I'll be able to come back again and and go more in depth into what is possible. Um, and feel free to forward me any of your questions in English uh, uh, and I'll be happy to respond. Okay, why don't, um, unless people have other questions, is there anybody else that has questions? We have five minutes left, um, but I think we should set up a, a, a protocol or a way for people to get in touch with Lori. Um, Lori, I'm happy to work with you to set up either email or some way that people can get in touch with you if they want. Mm -hmm. And then you and I can talk about scheduling a follow-up. How about that? Great. Yeah. Well, my email is simple, uh, Lori, L-O-R-I, at Dr. D-R-L-O-R-I-L-E-Y-D-E-N. I'll put it in there. Um, and actually, does uh, Google Translate in Gmail? Yes. Oh, wow. There you go. Well, you can, I can show you how. I can show okay. you that extension. Um, and Susan's also going to send you the handouts that describe um, how to do what we just did. Yes. Um, I will be sending out those handouts in the next hour. We will also have the recording so you could re -list, you could listen to this again and watch it. Um, and I think that will take, we'll probably have that out tomorrow. I know it's gonna be a lot quicker than the last time because we have the, the system down, um, but uh, give us 24 hours, I would say, and then we can get that out to you. Oh, um, good. Galena, Louisa, do you, either of you ladies have anything to add? Я хотіла тільки додати дуже велике дякую. I only wanted to, to, to express my uh, appreciation. Uh, uh, I'm very uh, grateful to our speakers uh, because uh, for everybody's uh, understanding, uh, Bruce's uh, uh, schedule is uh, uh, drawn up uh, uh, six months uh, uh, in advance. I guess uh, it is the same for uh, Lori. Susan is uh, just our angel who uh, often uh, stays behind the scene, but uh, is uh, uh, always uh, so supportive and uh, so uh, um, uh, helpful. I think uh, that uh, our today's uh, session was uh, extremely important and effective. Uh, we managed to um, cover several uh, techniques, uh, but uh, I guess it was uh, um, great. Just one more surprise, uh, okay? Wait. So there are uh, comments, uh, uh, words of appreciation in the chat box. Well, I am just so deeply honored to be able to serve in whatever way that I can. Um, and I am very confident that I'm going to challenge you all to do tap and breathe six to eight times for the next two days and then email me your results. What have you noticed? Imagine in two days that you could reset your physiology. That, that's a priceless, priceless gift. Mm -hmm. And then also to practice perhaps that petty annoyance um, protocol. Uh, and I so look forward to see seeing each and every one of you again 
and hopefully, hopefully every day, every day we pray for peace and um, may there be some significant progress by the next time we are together. Um, let me give you my Zoom hug. <laughs> Louisa, would you like to say something? Ну, я хотіла подякувати за сьогоднішню зустріч. I just uh, wanted to expand uh, my uh, uh, gratitude uh, to, to the speakers. Frankly speaking, uh, my pity annoyance uh, just left uh, away. Uh, it's not that it uh, uh, the feeling, my feeling, uh, or the intensity of uh, pity annoyance dropped down, but it just uh, left uh, away. Uh, my pity annoyance is something that I encounter on a daily basis, and uh, uh, it was uh, really, really annoying, but now it's uh, gone. Uh, now, speaking of uh, the challenge, I'm not sure uh, that uh, I will manage uh, to uh, make 68 rounds in two days, but I'll do my best to uh, do as many as possible. Uh, Laurie, uh, Susan, uh, Bruce, uh, thank you very much uh, for this session. I'm also grateful to my Ukrainian colleagues, Svetlana, uh, Galina. Uh, thank you for uh, organizing this. I'm also grateful to the interpreters, uh, to the technical team. Uh, I'm grateful to all the uh, participants who were present uh today and uh, i hope that even more people uh will uh, have an opportunity uh to familiarize uh, with the uh video um uh record in the upcoming uh days uh, uh, so the topic is is, uh, is is very on time because we feel this uh, stress, uh, which is overflowing sometimes, and we need to know how to um, deal with it. I just wanted to add uh, that time uh, uh, went by uh, very quickly. We didn't even notice uh, uh, the, the, the women are coming to an end. Uh, uh, which means uh, that it was uh, a very, uh, very uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, and uh, we need uh, uh, to uh, just uh, uh, to keep going in this direction. And I don't, don't know uh, what is so good about the number 68. Maybe Lori can explain, uh, but uh, anyway, we'll do our best to cope with the challenge. Uh, Lori, can you explain? say why 68 why not 65 for example yes six to eight times a day <laughs> <laughs> yes you wouldn't have time to do anything else uh, <laughs> six to eight times a day and but what would it say uh, I promise you that you... Uh, it's always so important to ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, I, was con I was confused myself. But you do not not have time to tap and breathe six to eight times a day because you are losing time and productivity and efficiency when you are not breathing properly. So I promise you that taking three minutes to do one, even one round or two if possible, will make you more efficient, will make you uh, problem solve much better um, and just physiologically allow you uh, to feel better. So uh, uh, that's what I encourage you to do. Can you imagine if, if you tried to do it 68 times and I came back on the next Zoom thing and we were like, I'm sorry, she's not available. She's tapping and breathing. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your participation. And we will be in touch. And I will, as I said, I'll send out the handouts in the next hour or so. Lori, thank you so much. Thank you. It's been wonderful. And I can tell you personally, I've worked with Lori before and I two years ago and I had the same reaction today, the same release today. So I'm testament. Thank you very much. Everybody have a wonderful evening.
Please be safe and take care. Yes. Bye-bye.